Um, well, let me uh, thank you all for the invitation to uh, speak to you. Um, I, let me begin with an anxiety. The anxiety is that um, I will end up being the poster boy for the limits of interdisciplinarity. Uh, <laughs> I work on the history of 18th century, uh, race, colonialism, and medicine. My actors don't know the word sustainability. It would be an interesting question to work out the preconditions for the word and the concept to exist. Um, I think there are, of course, uh, connections that we can make, particularly along the lines of climate and so on. Um, but yes, it will be a little indirect. But let me begin. Let me begin with three questions that actors in the 18th century would have asked. One, why do you get sick when you travel from, say, London to Jamaica? And, in, and why, and in many ways this is the tricky bit, why do you get horribly sick in some cases, then recover, and not ever get sick in that same way to that degree again? How is it, as they would phrase it, that you can become seasoned to a climate? Two. Is there a natural restriction to the kinds of plants and animals that one can transplant from one climate to another? Does human art stretch far enough to move a sheep, for example, from cold climates to warm ones and have its progeny produce wool of the same quality as those left behind? And three, why are some people black with curly hair and some people pinkish with straight hair? Are races fixed and distinct? Or can the successes of white people who move to warm regions eventually become black? Now, all three questions, of course, have something to do with climate. More importantly, 18th century actors would have seen them as intimately related. They are all questions about what would become known in the 19th century as acclimatization. But that word will not enter the French until the 1760s, German until roughly 1800, and English until the 1830s. The English word for the medical adaptation will be, as I noted, seasoning. And it shares meanings with all of the uses of that term that you know, from flavorful products kept out of season, to give winter food some pep, to woods and metals becoming accustomed to their eventual usages. Now, the project that I'm interested in is the intertwined answers to all those three questions. For one cannot answer the question of the origin of human races without an implicit or explicit comparison to the animal and plant world. In the 1870s, when Alfred Russell Wallace, co-founder of natural selection, of course, as a theory, writes the entry on acclimatization for the Encyclopedia Britannica, he rolls all living things into his answer. Things can become adapted to their environment, that is to say acclimatized in his language, only through natural selection. So not, for example, during the lifetime of someone, whereas of course these medical usages are of course within a few months or a few years. In the late 18th century, however, one was likely to get a very different answer. First and foremost, it was not at all obvious that humans were to be characterized with, with plants and animals. Plants might well be utterly bound to given regions, doomed to die under different skies, while humans were given the earth as their dominion by God. But human travel and movement, if it was possible, wasn't necessarily easy. And one can understand to some extent seasoning sicknesses as the necessary price to be paid for traveling beyond familiar climes. So since we only have 20 minutes here, let me pull out one of these questions, the medical part of it, and try and give you a feeling for how I'm trying to get at the relationship between illness and change of place. First, a quick bit of 18th century medical theory to keep you warm. Within the body, there's a complex equilibrium between various fluids, perspiration, blood, forms of bile, and so on. While all of these fluids are in equilibrium, all is well, but equilibrium is, as it always is, hard to maintain. Small changes can have catastrophic effects. Get a sudden chill, for example, and this might produce a stoppage of perspiration. Instead of leaving the body, the fluid might turn inwards and putrefy with a cascade of bad effects that then follow. 
and one's surroundings could have effects in other ways. Diet, both food and drink, the air one breathed. One can immediately see why one got sick when one travelled from a cold northern Europe to the warm West Indies. The body had been used to a certain balance of fluids due to climate and local foods and drinks. Now all had changed. For many, the seasoning sickness was the illness one got as the body adjusted to the new seasons. Now one needs that background to understand a related question. Are the diseases of warm climates different from the diseases of cold climates? On this point, the current literature is divided and it's where I make my first intervention. So Mark Harrison, for example, has claimed that underlying the diverse opinions expressed in colonial medical texts during the 18th century lay a single unifying theme, the distinctiveness of the tropical environment and its maladies. Difference. By contrast, Michael Warboys, a colleague, they fight this out in their texts, has argued that until the 1890s, the diseases experienced in warm climates were basically those found elsewhere in the world, basically a similarity argument, merely exhibiting special characteristics due to climate and other variables. The differences between diseases across the world were thought to be of degree, not kind. Now it turns out, luckily, I don't have to fight these two guys because they're really quite well known. It turns out that they're both right. You just have to periodize the 18th century correctly. Now I'll lay that out for you in a second, but first let me pull out yet another related question. We want to know whether diseases are distinct in tropical and temperate climates. Diseases depend on climates, so to some extent the question is about whether climates are distinct. That is to say, is there a tropical climate and a temperate climate? And it turns out, despite a long classical history of oppositions between polar, torrid, and temperate zones, it's not obvious for much of the 18th century that such broad strokes oppositions are possible. So one of the first outcomes then of my research is the suggestion that we divide the long 18th century up into three chunks. The first part, the 1670s to about the 1730s, where Warboys is largely correct. Diseases of warm climates are treated as versions of diseases of cooler climates. Often the comparison, for example, is like the summer diseases of Northern Europe. That's what you see in warmer climes. A second period from the 1740s to the 1770s, which functions as a kind of an intermediary, where one begins to see claims about striking differences between temperate and tropical climates and their diseases. And then a third period, where it's established, where difference is now the most important element in describing the relation between the diseases of warm and cold places. Now the general movement then is from similarity to difference, although I'm going to try and make that statement more complex as I go along. Let me begin by discussing my bookends, the first and last periods, and then spend most of my time on the transitional one, trying to pull out reasons for a shift. So the first period. One, we see in general the same diseases in the West Indies that we do in England, but they're modified somewhat by the climate. There are not diseases of warm climates and diseases of cold climates. The analogy, in fact, to the seasons is worth emphasizing. What one sees more often is the implication that one sees summer diseases much more often year round in Jamaica, and one doesn't see winter diseases very often. You also, however, and this is important, don't see diseases in Jamaica that you've never ever seen before in England. And then two, all climates are distinct. And this is the crucial point. For all the authors I've looked at, the climate of the West Indies was indeed seen as distinct to that of England. They're not stupid. <laughs> but only because all climates are distinct. There is no clear sense of a European or Occidental climate, or even of the unity of climate in the temperate zone. There was also no sense of a single tropical climate, where that term was used, which is not very often. Jamaica was warm, but so, as one person, Sloan, pointed out, was Montpellier in France. For Richard Town, writing in 1726, Jamaica's latitudinal location was medically important, but just as important was the fact that it was an island. Those regions don't have the same explanatory effect that they will later. So the third period is the one where I think Harrison's characterization is exactly right. By the end of the 18th century, tropical environments are medically distinct. So James McCabe, 1825, tells new medical men journeying to the tropics that there are a few of the diagnoses he learned at the schools in Britain that are applicable to the climate in which he resides. So 
Somewhere between the early 18th century and the late 18th century, diseases go from being similar between England and the West Indies to being utterly distinct. They also, and this is a key move that's often underplayed, go from being different across Europe and across the tropics to being largely similar within Europe and within the tropics, hence that large scale opposition that you can set up. So why? Why does this happen? So scholars have at least tried to answer the first part of this question. Kenneth Kippel and Kriemhild Ornelas have suggested that it's William Hillary writing in 1759 who was the first to report a significantly different disease environment in the West Indies from that of Europe. Now we can quibble about exact dates, we're historians or I'm a historian, that's what we do, but let's go with that date and look at the explanation that they offer. They point to two elements specific to the slave trade after 1700. One, a demographic explosion due to the slave trade, and two, outbreaks of yellow fever on the islands. Kepler and Ornelas plausibly suggest that Hillary's medical treatment of the huge numbers of those who suffered from the disease inspired his belief that he was working in a radically new disease environment. Now, there's no arguing that demography matters. You just need to look at this to get a sense of that demographic explosion and numbers of slaves. But I don't think it captures everything that's going on, nor do the yellow fever outbreaks of the 1720s and 30s. One way to show this quickly is to note what Hillary is writing against. And he's writing at least in, get, in part against a tract written by Henry Warren in 1740, a treatise concerning the malignant fever in Barbados and the neighboring islands. This text was based on Warren's medical practice on the island from 1734 to 38, a period that saw striking demographic changes and outbreaks of what Warren termed a malignant fever. But Warren does not argue that the West Indies presented a novel disease environment, very much the opposite in fact. Quote, we have no malignant distempers truly indigenous or natives of this island. The fever that had visited the island in 1725 was quote, generally thought to be introduced among us from Martinique. They blame everyone else. That's basically how this works. While that of 1733 was quote, really of an Asiatic extract. Absent illnesses of foreign origin, there were, quote, no other distempers being felt but what all parts of Europe are always being subject to. If outbreaks of yellow fever caused doctors to conclude that the disease environment of the West Indies was utterly different from England's, they should have done so in the 1730s, and they don't. So I want to offer three different reasons for the shift. The first has to do with a disastrous military defeat suffered by British troops within the so-called Torrid Zone. We should look, that is, not only at slaves, who, which are hugely important subjects here, but at soldiers too. Fired up by an easy uh, victory over the Spanish at Portobello in 1739, which is why Portobello Road exists, the English decided to attack Cartagena. The battle is a disaster, but proved the least of their worries. About 74% of the troops sent to the West Indies were dead, by October 1742, so within two years, 6% of them died from their wounds. All the rest died from disease. The effect of this on English observers within and beyond England was profound. It was hard not to suspect that something radically different was happening in the disease environment of this torrid zone. And one of the ways to track this sentiment is by the striking increase one sees in the number of texts published on shipboard diseases and on the diseases of warm climates as they affected soldiers and sailors in the immediate aftermath of this disaster. So Warren's text is published in 1740 and noted the effect of yellow fever on sailors. John Tennant, writing in 1741, described, quote, that epidemic fever so mortal among northern foreigners soon after they arrive in Jamaica and other parts of the West Indies. Now it's these uh, texts it's these texts taken as a genre that I want to point to as a second factor in producing the image of striking difference between temperate and tropical disease environments. J.D. Alsop has suggested that we read what he calls a location-specific literature, so the texts that I've mostly looked at so far concerned with the diseases of the West Indies and India, for example. Uh, so you look at those on the one hand and publications of naval surgeons and physicians as parallel components of a hot climate medical literature. 
Those medic military texts, as Allsop has very smartly noted, had certain common elements which distinguished them strikingly from location-specific literature written by doctors working, for example, in Jamaica. Naval surgeons mostly treated sailors, so their assumed patient was white, male, and fairly young. In a sharp contrast to many of the medical texts on the West Indies, blacks and women tend to appear in Mabel texts not as subjects or patients in their own right, but as abstracted figures who enter the text mostly to be contrasted to actual white male patients. That just isn't the case in the location-specific literature, where doctors were often called upon to deal with difficult births and to deal with slaves. Slaves are valuable commodities for the people working on plantations or running plantations. On this point, those doctors regularly pointed out that slaves suffered more greatly from diseases like dysentery or footworm, and not for racialized reasons, but because they were badly fed, housed, and treated. The naval medical literature tends not to distinguish between different parts of countries. Ports tend to stand in as synecdoches for entire nations, as you would imagine. To quote Allsop, the essential message, therefore, was a depiction of the common experiences of all Europeans confronted by all hot, humid climates, even though the medical expertise was very largely dependent upon observing and treating young males under arms in very specific locales. Location-specific literature, by contrast, often tended to equate parts of the West Indies and parts of Europe, even parts of England, breaking down large-scale differences between the tropics and temperate areas. The naval literature tend to play down differences between locations in warmer regions, marketing texts, and that's a key part of this, based on a single location as useful guides for all warmer regions of the Earth. You're writing for the East India Company. So Cleghorn, for example, uh, works in Minorca, which is the little cousin of Mallorca, which is not a great test case, but nonetheless argues that his understandings of diseases in Minorca apply to all warm climates that the East India, will sa East India Company will sail into. So both in the naval medical literature itself, very widely distributed through the services, and in its interactions with an ongoing location-specific literature, also aiming at larger markets, one can see genre helping to produce an image of large-scale difference. Finally, I want to point to a third factor tied to demography, but in ways that Kiplan or Nalis don't bear down upon, namely the ways in which the slave trade was seen as producing commonality of disease environments between Africa and the West Indies. That is, it's not that the West Indies and Africa are both warm and hence they have the same diseases, but rather that slavery is helping to make the West Indies like Africa. One sees elements of this from the very first text published. One may note that one of the most commonly mentioned diseases went by the name Guinea worm. But this idea reaches its high point in Hillary, and indeed I'd argue that what's most remarkable about Hillary's text is not merely that it stresses differences between Europe and the West Indies, but that these are almost all explained by the slave trade. As the number of imported slaves grew, I think one can begin to see this idea take hold, the notion that tropical disease environments are not born, but are made by the movement of slaves. So I want to conclude by attempting to reframe the question with which I began. To do so, let me get back to one of the elements I began with, the history of race. So a very brief detour into this literature. So 19th century racial thinking was characterized by four main tenets, some of them wrapped up in here. So one, size, two, fixity, three, inequality, and four, materiality. So that's that third point there. It's the move to make the size of races enormous and their number small, one race for every continent, for example. So you have five races, that's how you get the five, for the record, uh, that I want to focus on here. It may be the seemingly least controversial of the ones. I think we would, of course, reject two and three. Most people actually are kind of down with one in lots of ways. Uh, but it's a very late development as is a real distinction between the terms race and nation, both of which function as essentially equivalent translation of the Latin gens until the 18th century. So the Baron de La Hontan, traveling through Canada in the late 17th century, 
identified what he understood as 85 different nations across the landmass. By contrast, for Immanuel Kant in 1777, so about 100 years later, one needed only to speak of a single copper-red American race, one of only four major divisions of humanity. At some point during the 18th century, eyes that saw near innumerable cultural differences among non-European peoples began to so see only physical commonality. The same was true, I've argued here, for thinking about disease environments. Where one once saw many differences within Jamaica and within England, and both differences and similarities between England and Jamaica, by the end of the 18th century, European writers increasingly saw disease environments within Europe as similar, and those of the West Indies and other warm environments as strikingly different. For both race and understandings of disease, the shift happened across roughly the same period, from the 1750s to the 1790s, and part of the task of my current project is to try and tease out why this should be so. One intriguing avenue I've visited here is the role played for both race and medicine of military and naval doctors in producing the image of a white body out of place in the tropics. For now, though, I want to note that, most generally, the attempt to find the origins of tropical medicine in the 18th century seems somewhat misplaced. For much of the 18th century, place mattered too much in its details for the broad strokes of oppositions between torrid and temperate zones to make sense. The real question should not be, when did Europeans start seeing differences between their disease environments and those of other places, but rather, when and how did they start seeing broad-scale similarities within their geographical environments and those of locations between the tropics? You can see that a lot of the answers I've been trying to give have attempted to understand how intratropical similarity was made as much as how differences between the tropics and the temperate zone were constructed. So, I'm out of time, let me uh, stop there. I can put up a list of the literatures that I'd like to uh, engage with with this project, and let me thank you.